estimation, what is the most impactful day in the history of man? If you go back and look over all the history of man, would you say, what day would you say has been the most impactful day in all of human history? Someone might say, well, I think it was the day that Columbus discovered this new land. And what we have today and the blessings that we have and everything that is ours today is a result of that day. No, I don't think so. Maybe it was that civil war that we fought. You know, in this area, you know a lot about the civil war, at least you should, being as close as you are to one of the major battlefields. But no. Maybe it's World War I or World War II. Wait a minute, we can't use those because I asked for the most impactful day and those weren't days. Maybe it was when the U.S. dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Maybe that was the most impactful day in the history of man. No, I don't think so. So what day do you think? What day in your mind would you think is the most impactful day? The one day that changed everything. Crucifixion of Christ? Is that the day you think? You think Jesus being scourged, being nailed to the cross, dying that horrible death on that cross? Do you think that day is the most impactful day in the history of man? And I'm not taking anything away from that day. I know the importance of that day. I know what that day is. But I want to mention another day that made all of this other needful. It's found in Genesis 3. When Eve took a piece of forbidden fruit and ate it. And she gave to her husband Adam and he ate it. Because there would not have been a war had sin not entered the world. There would not have been a cross. There would not have been a need for a crucifixion. There would not have been the need for the shedding of the precious blood of Christ had sin not entered the world. And from Genesis chapter 3, throughout the rest of human history, we are feeling the effects of what happened in Genesis chapter 3. We should be thankful to God that He has provided for us a way to be forgiven so that we can stand justified, whole, and pure before Him. Because where we are tonight and why we are here is because sin entered the world and death by sin. In the book of Romans in chapter 5, in verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3 and verse 23. There's none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3 and verse 10. We have done and we do evil. We do that that's contrary to the will of God, and we separate ourselves from Him by sin. Sin has entered the world, and it has affected all of us. Isaiah would say in that beautiful Isaiah 53, that chapter that's talking about that sacrificial lamb, he said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, verse 6. Verse 7 says he laid upon him the iniquity of us all. But it's all because of a day when sin came into the world. It's all because sin overtook us. Because temptation came, and man gave in to temptation, and because he gave in to temptation, sin came into the world. And the result of that is that God had to send his only begotten son to die for me and you. And all of that, to me, tonight, makes that the most impactful day in all of human history because everything changed after that day. Nothing has been or ever will be the same 
as long as the world stands because of what happened that day. The result of that was that God had to send his son, and so he began to unfold the plan by which he would save the world. And so he promises Satan, he's speaking to Satan in Genesis 3.15, that he would put enmity between Satan and him. He talks to him about that seed that was going to come, the seed that was in her, reference to Christ. That promise is rehearsed over and over through the Old Testament. They're looking for that coming Messiah. They're longing for that one that's going to bear their sins because of what has happened. And because that sin now falls upon all of us because all of us have sinned. And the result of that is that we need a Savior. We need the Christ. And so here we are in the midst of our troubles and trials. The result of this is that God said that he was going to have to have his name preached. Isaiah said in Isaiah 11 in verse 9, he says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Wait a minute. Sin came into the world, and death by sin. And God, through Isaiah, said that the earth was going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. God determined that in the salvation that would come through His Son, the teaching of His will was going to have to be done to all men everywhere in order that salvation might be known, might be heard, might be understood. And so you open up the pages of the New Testament and have Christ who came to offer hope to a lost world. A world that's dying in sin. And you get to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up with the eleven on the day of Pentecost and says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which he did by you in the, mid in the midst of you. As ye yourselves also know him, being delivered by the term of counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. But God raised him up, and he lives, and he sits on David's throne. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so the church came into existence. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that that same Jesus whom ye have crucified has been made both Lord and Christ. They were cut to the heart. They said, men and brethren, what must we do? They were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. They that gladly received his word were baptized. That day there were about 3,000 that were baptized into Christ. The church was established on that day, the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from that day forward, God intended for this world to be filled with the knowledge of His Son. He intended for all people in every place to know about Jesus, to hear His message. Jesus, as, as, at, as He has now been raised from the dead, and as He is preparing to ascend back to the Father, He tells His disciples, the apostles, he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you all, even to the end of the world. Mark 16, 15 and 16, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He said, Go preach. Go teach. 
Go preach and teach to everyone in every place. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is now ready to depart from their sight. And he says this to them as the last words he says before he ascends to the Father. And I want you to note the words. In verses 7 and 8, he said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. I want you to notice something in that passage. I don't know that I've always noted it, but I noted it recently in looking at this. Jesus did not say, I wish you would. Jesus didn't say you should carry the gospel to the world. He didn't say you ought to let this be known to all men. He said you shall do this. You shall be witnesses of me. And I realize that he's speaking there of witnesses in a way that we're not talking about witnessing today. It's not that, so don't, don't take off in that direction. But brethren, he told them on that day, he said, you shall be. He didn't say, I wish you would. He didn't say, I wish you'd consider. And I would have you to know that this book still speaks tonight, this afternoon. And I would have you to know that he still is preaching the same message to us. God didn't tell us when it came to the lost of our community. He didn't say, I wish you would take the gospel to those folks. I wish you'd spread the borders of my kingdom. I wish you'd tell everybody about my son. God didn't say, I wish you'd do this. I hope you'll do this. I'd like for you to do this. Could you maybe do this? God said, you shall. If you're going to be my people, this is what you're going to do. And if you're not going to do this, you're not my people. We sit here in this building tonight and we've got a sign out front. It says Church of Christ. We call ourselves the Lord's church. We call ourselves His body. We say we belong to Him. Do we? Do we? Brethren, in the first century... You look at the church and you say what they did. You ought to take special consideration when you look at the book of Acts. You see, at home, I don't know how it is here, but at home, we've been doing a lot of preaching on evangelism and the need to be evangelistic and the need for us to get up and get to work. Quit lollygagging, if that's a good word. Because, brethren, we've got a work to do. We've got an obligation. We've got a world that lies in sin and is lost. And in the first century, they realized the importance of carrying the word to the world. And so the result of that was they went everywhere preaching. So that in Acts chapter 2, there are about 3,000 that are converted to Christ. Two chapters later, there are 5,000, not counting men and women, not counting women and children. Two chapters later, in chapter 6, they're multiplying in number. So quickly are they numbering that the Jews rise up to put a stop to this. The Romans rise up because there is this king now that's being preached. And so persecution is brought upon the church. And when they were persecuted, they went everywhere preaching the word. They did not, would not, could not stop. Preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you shall do this, and they did. Brethren, what's this message to us? You know, Paul is finishing up his third missionary journey in Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 21, he's making his way back to Jerusalem, and as he's waking, making his way back to Jerusalem... He tells them on that occasion, he says that he's going to be bound. And he tells them what's coming because he's been told. He's going to be bound and there are certain things that are going to happen to him. 
And so the brethren, because they love Paul, they're saying, oh, Paul, don't go, don't go. You can't do this. Stay here, Paul. Don't go to Jerusalem. And they're begging him not to go. In Acts 21, 13, he said, What mean ye to weep and break mine heart? I am not only ready to be bound, but to die at Jerusalem. I'm ready to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. He goes to Jerusalem. He's ultimately arrested and he's on trial. He's brought before Felix. In Acts 24 and verse 25, it says he reasoned with him of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, and Felix trembled. Paul is on, on trial for his life. He's standing before a judge who holds his life in his hands. And Paul is not concerned about his life. He's concerned about Felix's soul. I want to ask you, how many of us, if we were falsely charged, people had lied about us, they had made accusations against us that were not true, they had brought us before a judge, and this judge holds our life in his hands. And whether we live or die, he holds that in his hand. How many of us would be more concerned about the soul of that judge than we were about our own lives? Paul said, I'm more concerned about your soul than I am my life. He was more concerned about Felix's soul than he was his own life. You have that much care and concern for the souls of Hardin County? It's a tough question, isn't it? How many of you look upon your own life and say, my life is not much? What I would love more than anything would be to see my bread, my friends, my neighbors, to see them saved. You know, this same Paul writes the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter 9, down in verse 3, he said, I could wish myself were accursed. From Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul said, I would give my soul to save my nation. He said, I would give everything. I would give my own life if I could just save my people. Anybody here? that would be willing to give up your soul to save every person in Hardin County. I'd give my life. I'd give my soul. I'd give everything. And I know what my soul's worth. My soul's worth more than the whole world. I know what Jesus said. And I know how valuable that soul is. Paul did too. And Paul said, I would be willing to be accursed if I could save my people. Brethren, how much do the people in this community think, how much do you care about them? How much do they mean to you? How interested are you in their souls? How much? How long? What would you be willing to pay to save a soul? How much effort would you be willing to give? Brethren, because you had those apostles in the first century that were willing to die because you had those in the first century that were willing to give their lives for the cause of Christ. It's why they were able to preach that gospel to every creature under heaven. It's why they were able to do all that they could do as they did it. The apostles in Acts chapter 6 are being called upon to leave the word of God to serve tables. You remember what they said, don't you? They said, you look out among you and you choose seven men to take care of this. said, we're not leaving the Word of God to serve tables. Brethren, I wonder how many of us are spending our time serving tables instead of taking the Word of God, the Word of God to the world. How many of us have more interest in serving tables than we do in reaching lost souls? And understand, too, that those seven, I'm told specifically about two of them and what they did. Stephen is one of those seven that's chosen to take care of these Grecian widows that were being neglected. 
But Stephen is also someone who cares enough about his people that he goes out to preach to them. And he gives his life. He dies. He is stoned to death trying to save them. How much would you give? Philip leaves and goes to Samaria. And he preaches to those Samaritans about Jesus and the kingdom. And many are being converted, so many so, that when it word gets back to Jerusalem about all these in Samaria that are obeying the gospel, Peter and John go down there to lay hands on and impart spiritual gifts. And Philip is called upon to leave those Samaritans and go and meet a man. How many of us would be willing to leave Samaria where all these people are being converted and go down to meet one man. One man that's reading from the book of Isaiah. One man that you have to be able to leave at the right time so that when he leaves, it'll be the right time so that when you get to the point, you would intersect one another. This wasn't something where he just jumped in his car and drove a few miles and there he was. This took how much effort for him to walk day after day after day to meet a man in a chariot and save his soul. Tell me how much effort that took. How much was Philip willing to give to save one soul? Tell me what was the priority in the apostles' lives from Acts chapter 2 forward. What was it that was the priority in their lives? The most important thing in their lives. You know, they're told, stop preaching Jesus. And they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They beat them and told them, don't preach this anymore. And they said, no, we will. And we will not stop. And the only way they stopped them was to kill them. And when they killed them, it didn't stop the message. Because others picked up the mantle and kept preaching. And kept working. And kept going. The church kept growing. Rather back in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, if you drop down to verse 31... I again find something that's interesting about the growth of the church. I've been reading the book of Acts quite a bit lately, trying to see what they did to learn what they did to convert so many people. And so in Acts 9, I look at verse 31, and it says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified. The churches had rest, they were edified. You know what edification is, don't you? That's building up, that's supporting, that's undergirding, that's, that's holding up, that's lifting. So here the church is, and he says they were edified. But he doesn't stop there. Because he goes on to say they were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit were multiplied. You know when the multiplying came? When they were edified. You say, oh, I love coming to the building. I love coming to church. I love being able to be here. I love being able because I love the edification that I receive. I love how edified I feel when I leave here. I've just been lifted up. I feel so much better because I love the fact that Brother God preaches those sermons and he helps to lift us up and encourage us. And we're edified and we're built up and we're strengthened. Are you really? You really think you're edified? Because the thing that I find interesting in Acts 9 and verse 31 is that when edification comes, multiplication comes. So are you truly being edified? Or are you just being comforted in your own ways? Are you just made to feel good? Are you just stroked and comforted? Is that what it is? We're in the first century church when they were edified. 
they multiplied. And I would tell you that if we're not multiplying, I would check and ask myself, how much am I being edified? How much am I being strengthened? Because if I'm being strengthened, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to do more. I'm going to be determined to give everything I have to give to save a soul. I'll do whatever I have to do. I'll pay whatever price I have to pay to save a soul. Now, there are four things this church at Mount Zion is going to have to do if you're going to grow. Four things. And if you don't do these four things, you're not going to grow. As a matter of fact, you're going to die. The first thing is, you've got to be intent on growing. If it's not your intention, if you're not intent upon it, the early church grew because, and multiplied because they intended to. Brethren, they began in the very beginning and from the very time they preached the first sermon. They knew they were going to grow. They were intent on doing whatever they had to do to save the souls of those in their communities. To reach the lost. They would do whatever had to be done in whatever way it had to be done. They were intent upon saving souls. So much so that they would carry that gospel to every creature under heaven. When they were given that commission and told, go into all the world and preach the gospel, they didn't take that and say, well, I wonder what we're going to be able to do and how we're going to be able to do that. I wonder if that's even possible. I wonder if under the circumstances we could even do that. Or how we could accomplish that. But then I'm going to tell you the first reason why I find the church in the book of Acts growing like they grew was because they intended to. They were intent on growing. They were intent on doing whatever they had to do. And it wasn't some fly by night. It wasn't some, some great workshop they had had. It wasn't some great system they had found. It wasn't some new program that they had learned about. They were intent on doing whatever they had to do to carry the gospel to the world. And they would not stop. Nothing could stop them. They were intent on growing. So much so that if they beat them, they didn't stop. If they killed them, they didn't stop. They beheaded James. Peter's released from prison in Acts chapter 12. Knowing what's just happened to James because he's preaching Christ. Peter's released from prison. What's he go do? Go hide? Get out of Jerusalem? Escape? No. Not at all. He goes to preaching. You know how they stopped him? The only way they could stop him? It's the only way they could stop Paul. The only way they could stop those in the first century from carrying the gospel, they were so intent on seeing to it that the world heard the good news. Nothing could stop them unless they killed them. And even that wasn't going to stop them because they were going to be teaching it to others who were going to teach it to others who were going to teach it to others. And it was going to continue on until somewhere down the line, a generation arose that forgot. And so... They grew in the first century because they were intent on growing. They intended to grow. They intended to multiply. They intended to reach every creature. When they were told in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, they didn't say, well, I wonder what he meant by creature. They didn't say, I wonder if, if he really means everybody. I mean, you really think everybody? You really think we ought to be preaching this to anybody, everybody, wherever they are, whatever they are, whatever they believe, whatever their circumstances? You think we ought to teach this to everybody? Brethren, they were intent on taking the gospel to the world, and they did. Colossians 1.23, they had preached it to every creature under heaven. 
They multiplied in the first century because they were intent on multiplying. The second reason. The second reason that I find that they grew like they did was they multiplied their opportunities. Brethren, when there were those that didn't want to hear, they didn't give up. They moved on to those that did. When there were those that some would say aren't listening, won't listen, when Paul goes into the city of Athens and he's, he's angered because of all these gods they're worshiping and he preaches to them this true and living God and they didn't want to hear it, a multitude of them didn't. Paul didn't say, well, I don't know what else I can do. I'll just give it up. Paul went from there and continued his journey and preached to others that were willing to listen. Somebody says, I don't know what else we can do in Hardin County. I don't know what else we can do in this county. We're doing everything we can do. We're doing everything we can do to try to open doors, try to preach the gospel, try to reach the lost. We're doing everything we can do. We're doing everything we can possibly do right here. Then I tell you, get out of Hardin County and find somewhere where people will listen. Brethren, don't think that the only lost souls are in Hardin County. And understand if there's a place that you can do a work and reach a lost soul, then go do what you can do to reach a lost soul. And if that means you send someone to the Ukraine, you send someone, you help someone to go to Montana, you help someone to go wherever he has to go to find lost souls, send them wherever you have to send them, but send them where people will listen. If you say we've been trying in Hardin County all this time and people just won't listen, then don't give up, but find a fertile field and go sow the seed. Brethren, when Paul had tried and tried to reach his own brethren, the Jews, and the Jews would not listen, they would not hear. You remember what he said? Lo, I turn to the Gentiles. Here's a man who was willing to give his life to save his brethren, the Jews. Here's a man who loved his nation, who loved his people, would give anything to see them saved. But when they would not listen, when they would not hear, he shook the dust off his feet and he turned to the Gentiles. Brethren, too often we're so determined that we're going to reach the folks right here, next door. And we spend all our time and all of our energies trying to save a soul that has no interest and shows no interest and won't open a door. And we're determined that we're going to bull our way through. We're going to somehow, some way, we're going to get this into their hearts. While there are souls all over this world that are lost, that need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Rather than multiply your opportunities, look for every place you can go, every place you can send the word. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 42, it says, Daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not teach and preach Jesus. Brethren, they went wherever they had to go. They met with whomever they had to meet with. They did whatever they had to do to reach the lost because they knew the value of that soul. And before you give up on Hardin County, how much time are we willing to give to reaching lost souls in this community? How much time are we ourselves, by ourselves, how much time are we willing to give? Oh, preacher, we're doing about everything we can do. I mean, we sent out a paper, and we sent out over 9,000 copies of a paper. Went all over the county, went to every place. It went out from every post office, maybe except one. I tell you what, preacher, we've got, we've got a Facebook page and we have a one-minute devotional every day trying to reach people. I tell you, preacher, we, we've, got, we've got our sermons, our lessons, our studies that are being live-streamed. We're doing everything we can. We're trying to saturate the area. 
We're trying to find somebody, somewhere, somehow, some way, where we can get the gospel to all the world. And we're doing all these things. You know what that sounds like when I hear that? It sounds like you're trying to work your preacher to death. I know he loves it. He loves the work of the Lord. I know that. I know Gilbert. And he wouldn't be happy doing anything else. But I'm going to tell you, don't you sit there in your seat being so complacent thinking about what all we're doing when you're not doing anything except putting money in the treasury. And because we put enough money in the treasury, we can do all these things. We can send out all these papers. We can do all this teaching and preaching. And we've got a preacher and we want him to do it. And he does such a good job of it. And he does. But how much time do you spend trying to reach one lost soul? How much time do you actually spend trying to reach the lost? Personally, how much time, how much effort do you spend, how much would you give to save one soul? Of your own precious time. How many of you would get up earlier in the morning just to read and study the Word of God, just to learn it better? And how many of you, oh, listen, preacher, I, I just, I, I don't get enough sleep as it is. I don't rest well, I don't, I don't do good, and so I surely can't get up any earlier. And I can't stay up any later, I just, I wear out at the end of the day, and I, I, I just can't. And I'm already doing everything I can do. Everything you can do for what? Everything you can do to provide for your family, that's a good thing. Man provide not for his family, he's worse than an infidel, he's, 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 you, you need to provide for your family. We sent out all these invitations for a gospel meeting. I'm not asking you to tell me, but I'm asking you to ask yourself, how many people have I personally, with my own mouth, how many people have I personally invited to come and hear the good news? How many people have I tried to reach out to? Hey, listen, brethren, I know what it is to hear people say, no, I'm not interested, don't, take, don't bring that to me. Don't tell me that, I don't want to hear it. I know what that sounds like. I know how discouraging that can be. I understand that. But brethren, one of the reasons they were growing like they were growing in the first century is because they multiplied their opportunities. If people wouldn't hear in one place, they looked at another. Brethren, this was more important to them than anything else. When you meet your friends on Monday, how many of you are going to talk about the football game Friday night and how many of you are going to talk about the gospel from Sunday? How many people, when they get around you, they know that around you there are certain things you're going to talk about? And how many of your friends and neighbors know that if they're going to talk to you for any length of time at all, you're going to be talking to them about the gospel? How many of us are looking for every opportunity we can find to teach someone? I'll challenge you to do something this week. I want you this week... I want every one of you to bring your car and park it on the parking lot and I want you to sit here all day long and wait for somebody to come to hear the gospel. I want you to bring your car, I want you to park your car, I want you to sit in it. It's going to get hot. But I want you to sit there and I want you to wait for somebody to come to the parking lot to hear the gospel. Somebody come and peck on your window and say, can you teach me the gospel? And you say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And I'll tell you, it is. Pretty dumb. Not going to work. Because I'm going to tell you, you can park your car out here on this parking lot waiting for somebody to come to teach. Somebody to show up, peck on your window and say, can you teach me? Can you help me? Can you help me to learn the truth? Can you help me to be saved? I don't want to lose my soul. Help me. 
You can sit out here on this parking lot every day from now until the end of time, and I doubt very seriously that you're going to find very many people, if one, that you'll ever convert that way. Because they're not coming to the parking lot, and they're not coming into this building until we get out there in the community and start sowing the seed. Brother, we've got to multiply our opportunities. Third thing you've got to do, if we're going to grow, you've got to multiply the time you're willing to spend. You start talking to brethren about a personal evangelism program. Start talking to them about how that we need to get more people involved. How we need to do more. And people say, well, you know, I've got so many things. I, listen, I, I won't be able to be there. I can't come. Brethren, if we aren't willing to multiply the time we're willing to spend to save others, we'll spend time doing everything else. We'll spend time doing anything else you want to name. And listen to me. I understand that we have responsibilities to family. We have responsibility to others. We have responsibility to our employers. We have our responsibilities to others. But I'm going to tell you that too many folks have time that they are not willing to spend in trying to reach lost souls. We'd like to see it done. We'd like to save the lost. We'd like to help them be brought to Christ. But we don't have time. I had a fellow one time told me, he said, Preacher, I wish you'd just follow me around one day. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll follow you around one day. I'll follow you all day long to see what all you've got going, how busy you are, and how you have no time if you'll follow me around one day. Do you know he didn't have time? To do that? Brother, none of us do enough. None of us could do enough. None of us could do everything that's within our power to do and it wouldn't be enough to pay for what's been done for us. But don't you ever, don't you ever, when there is a work to be done, don't you ever say, I don't have time. You can say, I'm not going to spend the time. I'm not going to take the time. But don't you ever say you don't have the time. Because I promise you, no matter how busy you are, you've got time to do anything you really want to do. And if you really want to work in the vineyard, you'll find time to do it. Let me tell you the fourth thing that we're going to have to do if we're going to grow. You've got to multiply the workers. There's got to be more people working in the vineyard. Brother, there could be a better harvest if you had more workers. We don't have enough people working. We've got those that do much, that work hard, that try diligently. And with everything that we can do, and everything we will do, there's just not enough people. The Hebrews were written to in Hebrews chapter 5 and says, For when for the time you ought to be teachers, if you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, he's a babe. Second Peter 2 2 says, His newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. And in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, he said, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Brethren, are we growing? Are we spiritually growing? Am I growing myself? Do I have more time? Do I spend more time? Do I give more time? Do I look for more opportunities? Do I look for more to do? Do I take this work seriously? Do I take being a Christian seriously? Or is it just something I do? Is it something I feel like I need to do, I ought to do, I should do? 
Brother, if civil government came in and shut it down, shut down the church, drove you out of Hardin County, what would you do? What would you carry with you? Where would you carry it? What would you do when you got there? Brendan, the reason they grew so fast in the first century was because they took seriously the Great Commission. They took seriously the word that was given to them. They took seriously the responsibility they had. They were determined to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. They were determined to fight the good fight of faith. They were determined to die on the battlefield and not at home in their easy chair. Brethren, every member of this church is responsible for every soul in this community. And in the day of judgment, we're going to answer for the souls in this county. We may not convert a one of them, but we're going to answer for whether we've tried and how hard we've tried and what we've been willing to do and how much we were willing to pay to save a soul. The early church had one mission, only one. The early church had one mission, one goal, one work. And it was to save the souls of those who were lost. They were all of one heart and one soul. Acts 4 and verse 32. And the church prospered and they grew because they were focused on what their one work was, what their one responsibility was, what their one work was to do. Brethren, we can still grow. There are still lost souls that can be reached. There's more to do. And just as surely as the Lord says the fields are white unto harvest and send out the reapers, we ought to get busy doing everything we can do to reach the lost. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you need to come in. You need to get yourself on the inside where salvation can be found, where hope resides. And you need to come in with the responsibility of knowing that you have an obligation to do everything you can to reach every soul you can in this